I'm Norman Wahlberger. In this video, we're going to carry on developing an elementary point of view towards special relativity. So in our last video, we introduced a rather novel approach to special relativity, claiming that the essence of the theory from a mathematical point of view could be found, in fact, in Newtonian mechanics. And in fact, we don't have to use light and its remarkable properties at all. We can in fact develop the theory with sound and that offers several key advantages. So to set up this theory we were talking about bats and uh, bats operating in a one-dimensional world. A very Newtonian one-dimensional world so pretty much like the usual kind of world that we study in high school physics. And here is our friend Bat A, okay, who is upside down, uh, motionless in this one-dimensional continuum. Now last time we had some other bats flying around, in particular A's friend B. But we're going to simplify the situation today. Instead of having bats flying around, going one way and then the other, chasing insects and so on, we're going to have a much simpler situation which is still going to get at the essence of special relativity. We're going to suppose that bat B is moving at a uniform rate, drifting in this direction. Perhaps floating like a planet might float through space. And over here is another bat C, perhaps, that uh, is floating in the opposite direction. And the velocities of these bats, with respect to uh, ourselves here at A, are represented by these arrows. Now, in our last video, we had a stalactite, and we were bouncing uh, sound waves back and forth from the stalactite to create a clock. Today, we want to be a little bit more flexible, so let's replace the stalactite with a sm slightly smaller mirror. And suppose that our friend Bat A is holding this mirror out at arm's length and using the mirror to bounce sound waves back and forth. So it's a sound mirror more than a light mirror. All right, this, as we've seen last time, gives a notion of a clock for uh, Bat A. He can time the uh, ticks coming back from the, the mirror and that gives him an internal uh, clock that he can use to measure things, to measure his world. And now we'll assume that the same kind of situation is available to uh, Bat B. So she also has a mirror, and so she can also play the same game of bouncing sound waves back and forth from this mirror to establish her clock. And perhaps Bat C can be doing the same thing. Now this might be complicated, you might suppose, because Bat B is after all moving. And so the sound is going to be taking different times when it's going to the moving mirror and then coming back. If I am bat B, right side up uh, now, and here is my mirror, and I'm making a click so the sound is coming out there and then coming back. Well, if I'm moving in this direction, all right, then when I emit the, the sound, there will be a longer period of time before it gets to the mirror. And then on the return, it will be shorter because I'll be moving towards the mirror. So we expect that there's an asymmetry in the outgoing and the incoming uh, signals of bad B to the mirror and back. Nevertheless, bad B could still try to use this kind of thing to set up a similar kind of system as uh, we have for bad, uh, bad MA. All right, and what we're interested in is trying to represent what's going on with a space-time diagram involving a two-dimensional representation of the space axis, the x-axis in this direction, and then the other axis representing time. And basically our point of view and A's point of view are agreeing. So this is a very Newtonian situation. There is space in this direction and time t equals 1, time t equals 2, time t equals 3, clicking away uniformly. And here is the world line of bat A. It's not moving. And here's the world line of his mirror. And here are the sound signals. Okay. And the calibration in here is that of A. So that one unit is what he's decided his uh, length to the mirror is going to be. 
And he's decided that the unit of time is going to be such that in one unit of time, the sound is going to go from him to his mirror, and then back again. All right, in terms of the world diagram, here is bat B's world line, representing the motion of B on the x-axis, also sort of tabulated throughout time. And here is C's world line, C moving in this direction on the x-axis, represented by the world line there. And it's a little bit uh, at a shallower angle because C is going a little bit faster. And now we'll suppose we're interested in a particular event. For example, at a certain point, let's say that C flips his mirror. And we can register that from A by sending a sound wave from A at some point and bouncing off of C exactly when he's flipping the mirror and then coming back. And that was the system that we used to try to coordinatize our space-time from A's point of view. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at things not just from A's point of view, but also from B's point of view. And we're going to look carefully at the relationship between these two different ways of trying to understand this one-dimensional world in which they live. Now we may have a lot more sympathy with A because he is stationary and we can all see that B is actually moving. So yes, A has preferred coordinates from our point of view. Nevertheless, we're going to still allow B to make her measurements and we're going to see how the relationship between A's coordinates and B's coordinates really introduces the basic laws of special relativity from a mathematical point of view. So let me remind you the two basic formulas that we established for how, say, bat A can think about what's going on in his world. So when something happens, when there's an event, this event has a position on the x-axis and it occurs at a certain time. And we can see, for example, that this event has coordinates 2, minus 1, meaning that it occurs at that point in our one-dimensional space at time t equals minus 1. Now, how does bat A actually establish that from his point of view? So all what he is able to do is send these sound signals and let them bounce back and then receive them and make some computation about the relationship of the outgoing sound signal and the incoming sound signal. All right, this is all represented by these two equations here which relate the uh, x and the t coordinate of this event e to the times t sub i and t sub f which represent when the bat A would emit a sound signal towards E and when it would receive the reflected sound signal. And the X coordinate was the uh, difference between these two divided by 2. It represents how far out the sound got. And the actual time was the midpoint between the two points. In other words, the average. Alright, so this is a little bit different from light because light travels so fast that we basically see in our own experience that everything is instantaneous. But you will perhaps have experienced that if you're at some place where there's a, a, a gully or a big uh, canyon that you can make a sound and then the echo will take a certain amount of time to come back and you can judge how far away the other side of the canyon is by assessing how long it's taken the signal to come back. So when we use sound, we can get a sense of how far away things are by listening to how much time difference there is between outgoing and incoming. With light, that's essentially impossible for us because light is to all extent and purposes instantaneous in our ordinary world. That's an advantage that thinking about sound in this context that has over light. Alright, so bat A uses his mirror, first of all, to define the position plus one. So there's the, the world line of his mirror. He bounces sound between himself and his mirror to define time. Tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, and so on. And then TI and TF are used up here to coordinatize the plane. In other words, we can determine the position of an event in space-time 
by essentially recording the times of the output and input uh, signals. Okay, and by our assumption, we're living in a Newtonian world here. This is actually correct. In other words, it agrees with our coordinates. When A asserts that the position of this event is 2 minus 1, that actually agrees with us. We are looking down on the whole picture here. We see that, yes, the, this event actually did occur at uh, time uh, minus 1, position 2. All right, so bat B is going to mimic what bat A does. She herself has a world line there that represents the fact that she's moving at a steady pace along the x-axis. And she has a mirror that she's holding out in front of her whose world line is this parallel green line. It's always staying just in front of her. And she's bouncing sound signals between her and this mirror back and forth. Even though she's moving, she's still playing the game back and forth. And every time she gets a sound signal back, she records a time interval, say, of 2, and then 4, and then 6, and so on. Now notice that in this space-time diagram, the speed of sound is represented by this red line of slope 1, because we know that the speed of sound is one unit of distance per one unit of time. So the sound is actually traveling on a line of slope 1 or of slope minus 1 if it's going in the opposite direction. So here we have a slope 1 and then slope minus 1 and then slope 1 and slope minus 1. We can see clearly that it's taking a lot longer for the light to go from her to the mirror than it takes for, to get from the mirror back to her. That's obvious because as she's moving in this direction, the sound takes longer to get to the mirror and then much faster getting back. In terms of the uh, positions 1 and 3, she just interpolates. She doesn't know exactly when the sound gets to her mirror. She just assumes that it's halfway. So she will regard this point here as being 1 even though we can see that it doesn't actually correspond to when the sound actually gets to her mirror. So she has evenly spaced time intervals, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, generated by this clock going back and forth to the mirror. All right, and now she's going to use the same formulas that A did to try to put coordinates on a general event. Here, for example, is an event E, and to her, that event is visible by sending a sound at time t equals minus 3, represented by this line of slope 1, and then the bounced back signal, represented by this line of slope minus 1, which gets back at uh, time roughly, uh, say, between 2 and 3, maybe 2.6. And then the x-coordinate of this for her would be the difference between those divided by 2. So 2.6 minus minus 3 over 2, which is, say, 2.8. And the t-coordinate of this would be the average between this value and this value. 2.6 plus minus 3 over 2, say, uh, roughly uh, minus 0.2. So this is a different reading than A would get. A would get 3, 1, the same thing that's visible to us. Now to distinguish between A's coordinate system, which is essentially our coordinate system, because we're looking at this thing essentially from the same point of view as A is, we're going to use these square brackets here to represent A's coordinates for an event. And we'll use the pointy brackets to represent B's coordinates for the same event. So the event E will write it as pointy brackets 2.8 minus 0.2 and we'll also say that E is equal to square brackets 3, 1. This means that bat A thinks that that event occurs at uh, position 3 in time 1 while bat B thinks it occurs at position 2.8 and time minus 0.2. So we can see that there's a difference of opinion.
Naturally, we're on the side of A. Naturally, we can see that E is actually the point 0.31. We can see that B is diluted. We can see that B is not taking into consideration the fact that she's moving. Fine. But let's play along and see what the connection is in general between these two points of view. We might be in for a little bit of a surprise. All right, so while we're developing a somewhat new approach to special relativity, we're also showing you how to use linear algebra in simple situations. All right, this is a course in linear algebra. And so this is a prime example of applying linear algebraic ideas to understand situations. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to analyze this now in somewhat greater generality. Okay, we want to establish a relationship between the real coordinates of an event and B's coordinates for that same event. So here's an event E which has real X coordinate X, real T coordinate T. These are the coordinates from our reference frame which agree with the coordinates in A's reference frame. Now let's figure out what bat B would think about this event. In order to do that we need to impose some data that specifies B's velocity. So let's suppose that her world line is such that it's in the direction of the vector RS. In fact, let's suppose that her clock is such that it ticks 1 exactly when we're at the position RS. Okay? So these are all multiples of RS. This is B's world line. And this happens to be time t equals 1 for her. Times t equals 2 would just be 2 times Rs, and so on. Okay, so what we have to do is we have to find where, on her world line, we would have to be positioned so that a sound wave would get to E just at the right uh, time, and then where that sound wave would reflect back on her world line. And this is an easy application, I hope, of just some basic vector geometry. Because these lines here are lines in the direction 1, 1 and minus 1, 1. This is a line which has slope 1. It goes over 1 and up 1. It's a multiple of the vector 1, 1. And this is a line that's in the direction minus 1, 1. So what we're asking is, what are the numbers ti and tf such that if we start with xt and we subtract some multiple of 1, 1, here's the vector 1, 1, and we're going in this direction, subtracting some multiple of 1, 1, then we should get ti times rs. ti times rs is this point down here. And if we start at xt and we add some multiple of minus 1, 1, that's a vector in that direction, then we get another multiple t sub f times rs. All right, so these two equations represent the information that the separation between here and here is a multiple of 1, 1, and the separation between here and here is a multiple of minus 1, 1. Let's call these equations 1 and 2. Now we're just going to do a bit of algebra with them. Okay, very simple, but this slide is very important because it establishes the basic transformation that underlies special relativity. Okay, so well, let's take this equation. It's an equation involving a vector. So it actually is two equations, one representing the x component and another representing the t component. The x component is x minus lambda equals t sub i times r. And the t component is t minus lambda equals t sub i times s. These are two equations in unknowns lambda and t sub i. We can get rid of the lambda by taking this equation and subtracting that equation. Then we'll get x minus t equals t sub i times r minus s. Dividing by r minus s, we get t sub i equals x minus t over r minus s. Please check that. Now we're going to do the same thing for the second equation. Here is the first component. 
x minus mu equals t sub f times r. And the second component, t plus mu equals t sub f times s. Again, we don't really care what mu is at this point. We want to eliminate mu, so we'll add this equation to this equation. So the mu's cancel. We'll get x plus t equals t sub f times r plus s. Dividing by r plus s gives us t sub f equals x plus t over r plus s. So these two equations here tell us that if we know what rs is, and we know what an event e is, the coordinates xt, then we can find what t sub i and t sub f are just by these formulas. Now, how does b use t sub i and t sub f? She takes their difference divided by 2 and their average to find her x coordinate and her t coordinate for that same event. Let's call her x coordinate x prime and her t coordinate t prime. So these pointed brackets, I remind you, are meaning that we're talking about b's coordinates. So the same event has a coordinates x and t and has b coordinates x prime t prime. How do we get x prime? We take t sub f minus t sub i over 2. This minus this over 2. Well, we want a common denominator. Here there's an r plus s in the denominator. Here there's an r minus s in the denominator. So the common denominator will be r squared minus s squared. There's a 2 coming from here. So when we do the common denominator, t sub f minus t sub i, we'll have to multiply x plus t times r minus s, and we'll subtract uh, r plus s times x minus t. All of that divided by 2r squared minus s squared. And then when we look at this numerator here, there's a bit of cancellation. The rx and the minus rx cancel. So there's only minus sx. There's a minus sx here and a minus sx there. Divided by 2 is a single minus sx. And the rt uh, here and the minus r times minus t, that's 2rt. Divided by 2 gives us a plus rt. The t times minus s and the t times plus s also cancel. So this simplifies pleasantly to give us this expression here minus sx plus rt over r squared minus s squared. And the story is very similar for t prime. It only differs from this one by changing that minus sign to a plus sign. So instead of having that minus sign, there's a plus sign here. And so the same kind of thing happens, except different things cancel. Now we have an rx and an rx that are not canceling, so it ends up uh, there. And we have a minus st and a minus st not canceling, and it ends up there. And the two terms that we had over here uh, cancel. So the minus sx and the plus sx cancel, and the rt and the minus rt uh, cancel. So we get rx minus st over r squared minus s squared. Okay, so these are fundamental formulas. These are the simple formulas that relate the x and t coordinates of an event as measured by a and by us to the x and t coordinates as measured by b. The denominator is r squared minus s squared. So please make sure that you understand the derivation of everything that's on this page. Okay, very important. If you understand the whole story, go through it, check the algebra, make sure you understand what the geometrical argument is. All right, this is the essence of special relativity in a sense. Great. So let's have another look at those two formulas that we derived. Here they are again. Okay, there's the formula for x prime in terms of x and t, and in terms of r and s, the position of the vector that describes B's world line. In fact, describes the clock on B's world line. X prime there and T prime there. So the coordinates of an event E 
with respect to A are X and T, and with respect to bad B are X prime and T prime. Now we know when we have this kind of situation, it's pleasant to rewrite things using a little bit of matrix algebra. That's what we like to do. So we'll write X prime and T prime as a vector. And we'll rewrite these equations in matrix form, because it's a linear transformation, really. The X and the T are appearing linearly here. So in terms of input X, T, output X prime, T prime, that's a linear transformation. We are in familiar territory here. We know that we can represent this transformation by a matrix. The matrix is just the coefficients, minus S and R, there. Well, divided by r squared minus s squared, which is a common denominator for everything. And the second one, rx minus st here. This is just the formula for x prime. This is the formula for a t prime. And now we're going to do what we do in linear algebra. Right? The fundamental question in many such situations like this, going right back to our first lectures on linear algebra, is how do you invert such a linear relationship? Here's x prime and t prime in terms of x and t. The natural question is, what's it look like the other way around? What is x and t in terms of x prime and t prime? Well, we know we just have to invert this matrix. Please check that this matrix is the inverse of this thing here. You can just do that directly just by matrix multiplication. So the inverse relationship is very much like this relationship. It doesn't happen to be this little factor, but otherwise it's much the same here except that a minus sign is missing. All right, so now we can use this actually to show what B's coordinates look like. So here is uh, our space-time diagram as usual. Here is A's time axis and A's x-axis. And here is the world line of bad B, given by the vector Rs. So what this is telling us is that the, uh, the vector 0, 1 in her coordinates if you put 0, 1 in here, you get Rs. That's the vector that's in her time direction. If you put 1, 0, you multiply, you're going to get the first column, Sr. That's telling you that's her uh, vector in her x direction. That's her vector, 1, 0. Here is A's vector, 1, 0, and our vector, 1, 0. Here is her vector, 1, 0. So her x-axis, which we'll call x prime, is in this direction, and it's marked off 1, 2, and so on. Here's her t-axis, which we'll call t prime, marked off 1, 2, and so on. And we notice that this vector rs and this vector sr are intimately connected. They are just obtained by interchanging the x and the t coordinates. In other words, they are reflections in the line of slope 1. All right, that's a very important fact. This RS and this SR are symmetrical with respect to our line of slope 1, which represents the speed of sound. Now, there's an um, important remark to be made here about the meaning of this uh, denominator here, the same denominator that we, we had up here. So, her two basis vectors make a parallelogram, just as A's two basis vectors make a parallelogram. The area of A's basis vector parallelogram is 1 times 1, which is a 1. The area of her basis parallelogram, right here, is given by the determinant of the matrix S, R, R, S. S, R, R, S, exactly that determinant there, which is S squared minus R squared. So the meaning of S squared minus R squared is it's the area of this little parallelogram. So let me remind you that uh, R, S, the actual position of R, S, depended on how far out her mirror was. So she could rescale her time axis 
by moving that mirror closer or further away. That would make her ticks further apart or closer together. She has some freedom in scaling, just as A does. And at first you might think that these two things are independent, that it's going to be hard for A and B to agree on how to scale their respective time and therefore respective x-axis. But a fundamental property of linear algebra comes in that also goes back to our first videos in the course. When we started the course, I emphasized that linear algebra was actually about affine geometry. I hope you recall. Affine geometry, the geometry of the plane where vectors and linear relationships and parallelism are the important quantities. But perpendicularity doesn't play a role and there's no distinguished distance measurement. In that context, you may remember that area was a key notion. All right. So although A and B cannot agree on lengths, they cannot necessarily agree on perpendicularity. One thing that they can agree on is the relative sizes of the two areas of the parallelograms that their bases vectors form. And I'm going to draw in here the uh, parallelogram formed by A's basis vectors, that red one. The ratio of that red parallelogram to the green one is a number that's accessible to both of them. All right, so now we're going to introduce this canonical affine normalization. And then we're going to get sort of more standard symmetrical forms for the Lorentz transformations. And everything will appear very, very simple here now. Okay, so the crucial thing is that, as we've said, area is an affine quantity. It's, of course, really the ratios of areas that is an affine invariant, independent of linear transformations and changes of coordinates. So we're going to renormalize so that the, the area formed by the two basis elements of B, namely RS and SR, that the wedge between those is equal to the area between the two basis elements for A, namely 1, 0, and 0, 1. In other words, that S squared minus R squared equals 1. Another way of saying that is in terms of the vector RS, which is the vector that we started with, that RS lies on the hyperbola x squared minus t squared equals minus 1. That's an equivalent way of saying this normalization condition. And that's convenient because we can picture this hyperbola in the x and t coordinates. It's this green hyperbola right here. This is x squared minus t squared equals minus 1. And it has another branch down here. It's called a rectangular hyperbola. If this was a plus 1, then we would have hyperbola going like this. This uh, hyperbola plays an important role in special relativity. It's the uh, analog of a circle in the geometry here. All right, so if s squared minus r squared equals 1, then those previous transformations that we wrote down take on this simpler form. This is exactly what we had before. But before, we had a 1 over r squared minus s squared. So if we have this condition, then that becomes a minus 1 and multiplies through to give us this simpler matrix here. So we get x prime t prime equals s minus r minus rs times xt and xt equals srrs times x prime t prime. And these two matrices are exactly inverse matrices. The only difference is that here there's a plus sign in front of the r, and here's the minus sign in front of the r. So these are Lorentz transformations, and they were introduced by uh, important physicist uh, Lorentz, uh, just before Einstein's theory of relativity came out, and they were an important sort of ingredient in, in that story.
So here we're seeing them in perhaps a novel way that's actually a consequence of the way bats might communicate if they, if they had more inclination to do so and maybe some more uh, mental powers. Who knows, there might be some very intelligent bats out there that do something like this. In any case, this is a linear transformation that takes us from A's coordinates to B's coordinates, and here's a linear transformation that takes B's coordinates to A's coordinates. Now we've very much been in the camp of A, right? We've said this is a Newtonian situation. X is just sitting there, there's our space. Time is ticking on exactly as it does in our regular world. A is stationary, B is moving. We've talked about B having this curious form that light bounces back and forth asymmetrically between her and her mirror. Although we didn't say the same thing about A. We said, yes, A is obviously, the light is bouncing back symmetrically between him and his mirror. Although, in fact, we don't actually know that. At least A doesn't know that. Now, these transformations give us pause. They give us pause for thought because the situation is now so obviously symmetrical between A and B. What appeared to be an asymmetrical situation is mathematically essentially symmetrical. The difference between the R and the minus R is just an artifact of the fact that we agreed that B was moving in this direction. If B had been moving in that direction, the R would have been negative. So these transformations show us that there is some fundamental symmetry here between the point of view of A and the point of view of B. This is surprising. Okay, and perhaps it's very surprising. And the implications of this are, uh, are very significant. And at least suggest to us that perhaps the laws of physics, perhaps, ought to be such that they look the same from A's and B's points of view. That's just an idea that we might have. That was an idea that was very important in Einstein's formulation of things. But at this point, it's certainly suggested by the symmetry that's appearing here. This hyperbola is important for us. It's the relativistic analog of a circle. And it's going to be really useful for us to have a parameterization of this hyperbola so that we can talk about points on it. But, of course, we want to do things logically. And we want to do things correctly. In other words, we want to have a rational parameterization of this hyperbola. Just as, I hope you've absorbed from me by now, that the rational parameterization of a circle is almost always far superior to the usual parameterization in terms of cosine and sine. Unless you actually have uniform motion around the circle. That's the only situation, or something equivalent to it, where the cosine theta, sine theta parameterization is better. So physicists, we're going to have to rethink the way you think about this hyperbola here. Okay? Um, probably some of you already think in this way, but I know some of you do not. So you, please have a little shift of uh, thought. Okay, so how are we going to parameterize this? We're going to parameterize it in essentially exactly the same way we parameterize the unit circle and that I've talked about in many of my videos. So we're going to start with a point on the hyperbola. We're going to choose this point down here. And we're going to choose a parameter on this convenient uh, line here, say M. So that's the point M0. We're going to join this point here, which is 0 minus 1, to M. And we're going to see where it meets this hyperbola. Okay, so let's have a look at the linear algebra of that. Here is the point 0 minus 1 expressed as a vector. Here is the vector from this point to this point. The difference between here and here will be m1. This vector is the vector from here to here. We want to add a multiple of that vector to get to this point here, which is, so just lambda times this will be lambda m and lambda 1 plus minus 1 there. So we want this point, whatever lambda is, to lie on H. In other words, that it satisfies the condition X squared minus T squared equals minus 1. So we want this thing squared minus this thing squared to equal minus 1. Well, if we expand this out, that's lambda squared M squared. 
Here there's a lambda squared, a minus two lambda, a plus one. That plus one with this minus sign will cancel with the minus one that's on that side. And we'll end up with lambda squared times m squared here, minus one, plus two lambda. The minus two lambda times minus one is plus two lambda. So this is equivalent to this. And now we can factor out a lambda. So lambda equals zero is one possibility. And the other possibility is to solve for lambda after you've divided lambda out. Namely, lambda equals two over one minus m squared. So bring the two to the other side, that's up with a minus one, divide by this, and I'm just rewriting uh, that to, to multiply it by minus one there. All right, so that's the, uh, the lambda that works. So the actual point P that we're after is lambda times m, lambda minus one. So there's the lambda times m, and lambda minus one, if we subtract one here, that's like subtracting one and then adding m squared, that's one plus m squared. So here's the form. That's a parameterization, it's a point P that lies on the hyperbola, which happens to uh, be lined up with this point m zero, with the zero minus one. So two m over one minus m squared, one plus m squared over one minus m squared. And if you're a relativistic physicist, that's probably a good parameterization to memorize. And of course it's very similar to the rational parameterization of a circle that we uh, know and love. So the rational parameterization of a circle, I remind you, uh, is very similar, uh, but if you put plus signs there and a minus sign there, and usually I flip them over but it's not really necessary, then you get the parameterization of a circle. So let's call that E of M because it depends on M. That's a point on the hyperbola. Now this hyperbola is a little bit interesting because it actually has two branches. The top branch, which we might call H plus, and the bottom branch, which we might call H minus. We can see that if M is between minus one and one, then this line is going to meet uh, the top branch. While if M is outside here somewhere, then it's going to meet it at another point uh, on the lower branch. So if minus one is less than m is less than one, then e of m belongs to the top branch. If m is bigger than uh, one or uh, m is less than minus one, then we're on the negative uh, branch. And of course, if m equals one, if m equals one, well, then we have some uh, problem there. Then essentially we're sort of at infinity. And I remind you that these two lines here are sort of asymptotic. They are sort of the directions when m equals one. All right, this is a parameterization of x squared minus t squared equals minus one. And for most applications, and especially in relativistic physics, this is far superior to the Sinch theta, Cauch theta that you find in many textbooks. So if you're teaching physics, think about switching over here. Okay, it's a very good step. Because it's rational. No transcendental functions required. All those logical difficulties with real numbers and infinite processes are finessed. Don't have to worry about any of them. It's just a rational expression involving high school operations. And you can compute it. It's nice to have explicit examples. So let's have a look at a particular case when m equals one-third. So if we calculate e of one-third, just using that previous formula, so there's two times m over one minus m squared, and here's one plus m squared over one minus m squared, we get three quarters, five quarters. So that's the point RS on the hyperbola, which is in the direction of a bat B, and which represents a tick of her clock. Tick, tock, tick, tock. Its reflection, the point five quarters, three quarters, is the basic vector representing her unit length in her x-axis. So from her point of view, all these points here have t-coordinate zero. All of these points are representing simultaneous events. For us, or for A, all of these points on the space-time diagram are at the same time namely time t equals zero. All these points are 
time t equals 1. All these points are time t equals 2. From b's point of view, it's quite different. All these points are t prime equals 0. All these points are t prime equals 1. All these points are t prime equals 2. All these points are uh, x prime equals 0. All these points are x prime equals 1, and so on. Just the lattice generated by these two basis vectors instead of these two basis vectors. The Lorentz transformations, well, we can write down the matrices very explicitly. If R and S are these numbers, I remind you, uh, here is S minus R minus RS. The one quarter is just part of the R and S coming out. So X prime T prime is that matrix times XT, and XT is that matrix times uh, X prime T prime, much the same except without the minus signs. Okay, so here's some exercises for you. I want you to have a look at this diagram, make a good picture of it. Okay, Try to uh, get a sense of how to go from B's point of view to A's point of view. It's a good idea to think about sound signals. Right? B is moving this direction, she's sending out sound signals and then waiting for them to come back and using those two pieces of information to judge where and when things are. That's all what's happening here. So I want you to compute coordinates, both from A's point of view and from B's point of view, of various events on our diagram. And for example, events E. What's this event E? Well, event E is obtained by taking uh, her uh, vector 1 here and going parallel to her uh, x prime axis. So it's a simultaneous event. So it's really the event that corresponds to A's position at time t equals 1 from B's point of view. Right. So this, geometrically, E is formed by taking this line here, a parallel line there, and going down to, to meet that axis. And similarly, uh, F is obtained by taking uh, this line, which is her T prime axis, translating it to go through her X prime vector. That's F there. G is obtained by taking this point and going directly over to G. So same A time. And uh, H is obtained by taking this point and going directly down. So same X coordinate. And J, K, and L, where is J? Uh, J is this point here, which is obtained by taking one here and going parallel again to this direction up to her uh, axis here. And uh, K is over here, same kind of story. We're taking one here and then going up in this direction to there. And L is the place where her um, parallelogram has its vertex. So a good chance just to practice coordinates. You can use the Lorentz transformations just to get explicit values. And you can see various relationships. Maybe you'll see some interesting relationships between various points. Okay, once we have positions and times, we can talk about velocities. Velocity equals distance over time. So find A and B velocities for a particle with world line FK. So imagine a particle which, whose world line is the straight line from F to K. In other words, it's starting here at, at A's time uh, 0, and at this time, roughly uh, 1, it gets to this point here. So it moves like this uh, in A's uh, time t equals 0 to time t equals 1. So it has a certain velocity from A's point of view, also has a certain velocity from B's point of view, which is not necessarily the same as A's velocity. So just a good uh, initial stab at uh, measuring velocities and seeing that they're not the same. They disagree about velocities, these two observers. Which one of them is right? Well, the symmetry of things suggests that maybe that answer is not so easy to come up with. Maybe they're both right, or maybe they're neither right. Maybe things are relative. Okay, so there's a few complications that um, I've sort of finessed in our last uh, few slides that I have to tell you about. 
And the first one has to do with orientation or the direction of sound. So we've perhaps been supposing that these sound waves, you know, they go out and then they come back. And which direction they're coming from perhaps doesn't matter, but in fact it does. It certainly matters to bats, because bats have these very uh, directional ears that can pick up exactly which direction the sound is coming from. So coming from this direction, coming from this direction are quite different for a bat and also for us too. So we can see that uh, in the following situations. Here's the usual thing with the uh, A's axes and, and B's axes here as before. And here's some event E. And, uh, and here's another event F. Okay, so this event E and this event F are related in an interesting way. They both seem to have the same initial and final T coordinates. So a sound wave emanating from here in this direction will bounce off F and come back here, and in this direction will bounce off E and come back at the same time. So if we just use TI and TF, then it's ambiguous whether we're talking about event E or event F. If we go back to that uh, important derivation that we uh, used, so we had these formulas, right, that uh, told us that uh, from an event xt, we're going to go uh, some multiple 1, 1 down to uh, get tirs. And uh, to get tf, we're going to start at xt and go a multiple of minus 1, 1, the other uh, direction. It's probably better if we let go of the idea of initial and final times. And rather think about the times as being associated to these two vectors. Okay, so we might, uh, for example, uh, call this vector uh, v minus plus one one, and this vector v plus minus one one. That way, we can call uh, this time t plus and this time t minus instead of t final and t initial. In other words, that'll then mean that the uh, time. Uh, here t minus of e of this thing here will actually be equal to t plus of f of this one here. And this time here is both t plus of e and t minus of f. That will mean that our formulas are consistent and are linear. Okay. So that's also going to suggest that these two vectors um, should probably play more of an explicit role in this uh, theory. So in fact, there should actually be not just two frames of reference that are floating around here, namely A's frame of reference and B's frame of reference. There is really also this third frame of reference that you might call sounds frame of reference, okay, that represent the actual time lines of sound. That's going to be interesting, and we're going to develop that uh, in our next video. Another complication is what happens if a bat moves at the speed of sound? It's not theoretically impossible for a bat to go relatively fast. Speed of sound is pretty fast, but it's not that fast. And what happens? What happens if a bat happens to move faster than the speed of sound? Does this theory still work? What, what's going on here? You may know that in special relativity, one of Einstein's you know, ideas is that nothing goes faster than the speed of light. Is that a mathematical consequence of what we're talking about? Well, we'll, we'll have, to have a, a think about that. So in our next video, we really have enough now to uh, deal with a lot of familiar aspects of relativity, including famous length contraction, time dilation, and the uh, sort of Einstein addition of velocities, which is very counterintuitive, the way velocities add in when you look at things from different reference frames. All right, so we're going to uh, basically derive a lot of the uh, classical uh, manifestations of special relativity. We can talk about the twin paradox and so on, poles going through uh, barns. All of that stuff can be addressed in the framework that we've developed here. And I remind you that we're not really going down Einstein's road, okay? We have not
postulated that all things look the same in all reference frames. And we have not postulated significantly that the speed of sound is the same in all reference frames. It's more just that things develop because of the way we measure things. Now, this could be an important uh, point of view. So next time we're really going to get at the nuts and bolts and we have enough machinery now to drive many of the interesting and surprising consequences of special relativity still in this relatively Newtonian situation just involving bats drifting around in their bat cave. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.